Welcome to some lab. I want to take a look at something really interesting today. I want to look back at some of the history of chemistry really, really early on. Now, this isn't in this idle curiosity. This helps us think about how we perceive chemistry and also gives us a bit of insight of the importance of good notation and terminology. So this is a picture of a Benedictine monk, Basil Valentine, who wrote a number of works on alchemy. Now, we don't actually know if that was his correct name. It's likely that it was some kind of pseudonym, and it might actually be that Basil Valentine was more than one person. But he did publish several different books. We have The Triumphal Chariot of Antimony, The Medicine of Metals, Of Things Natural and Supernatural, The First Tincture, Root and Spirit of Metals, and His Last Will and Testament. The work that really interests me is called The Twelve Keys. It was published in 1599, and editions of this book have these fantastic illustrations, woodcuts, that were done on the second edition 19 years later. The first one shows the king and queen, and something about a wolf, and a leper, and some fires, and stuff going on. Second one's got mercury, and got two swordsmen, one with a chicken on his sword, and the other one with a snake. The third one, fascinating to me, we've got a wolf in the background, no, not a wolf, a fox being attacked by a couple of birds and a dragon in the foreground. Uh, this one is on death, and the next one, who knows quite what's going on, some sort of thing coming out of a plant, and a strange looking guy with some bellows. Uh, number six has got the king and queen getting married, and an alchemist in the foreground. Number seven, we're starting to get diagrammatic here, but as far as I know, no one knows exactly what this particular diagram means. Uh, number eight shows us some resurrection, a whole lot of biblical references. Number nine, this weird posture looks like it came out of some sort of yoga book. The thing is, Basil Valentine viewed himself as a medical practitioner and his research that he was doing on metals, he saw as a valuable part of that. The next one is again diagrammatic, but difficult to decipher. The Latin, I don't know, the symbols are alchemy, and uh, the Hebrew is either nonsense or some kind of code. Uh, this one's fascinating. Number 11, we've got two women riding on lions. One's trying to eat the other one, and one's farting on all his cubs with a swordsman in the background. And this is the culmination of the whole thing, and the summary of the entire work. And in this one, we've got the lion finally devouring the impure snake, and the alchemist in his workshop doing what he does. Let's read an excerpt from the first key. It says... Let the diadem of the king be of pure gold, and let the queen that is united to him in wedlock be chaste and immaculate. If you would operate by means of our bodies, take a fierce grey wolf, which though on account of its name be subject to the sway of warlike Mars, it is by birth the offspring of ancient Saturn, and is found in the valleys and mountains of our world, where he roams about savage with hunger. Cast him to the body of the king, and when he has devoured it, burn him entirely to ashes in a great fire. By this process the king will be liberated. And when it has been thrice performed, the lion has overcome the wolf and will find nothing more to devour in him. Thus, our body has been rendered fit for the first stage of our work. Now, what are you going to make of all of this? This does not sound like chemistry at all to me. Irvin Raffner, author of the Esoteric Codex, interprets the first key like this. He says, Gold, the king of metals, is dissolved in modern antimony or stibnite the ravenous wolf, the child of Saturn, and is subject to Mars. An alloy of antimony and gold, that's the wolf that has devoured the king, sinks to the bottom of the crucible and can be roasted to evaporate the antimony. This transformation leaves a purified gold behind, renewing the king. All of this actually makes pretty good sense, but it does seem a really weird way to say things. So who were the alchemists anyway, and why did they write the way they did? You start doing some research on alchemy and you find all sorts of crazy things. You quickly find yourself in a mire of all kinds of New Age spiritism and quackery and weird kind of stuff. But I put it to you that these alchemists were actually genuine scientists trying to make sense of the world and recording details of the experiments they did and sharing them with one another in an early form of the scientific method. And there were reasons for the cryptic writing. The twelve keys described a process to convert lead into gold. Evidently, Basil thought he'd achieved something that was really worthwhile and something lucrative. And one of the reasons for the cryptic language is to preserve a trade secret. We do much the same thing today. His writings were designed to be completely nonsensical to anyone unacquainted with the arts of alchemy. There's a second reason for the cryptic language. He lived in a time when his work was neither appreciated nor trusted, and again, there are parallels with our present day. 
We live in a world that is skeptical and even terrified of chemistry. Chemical industry has got really bad connotations, and the subject of chemistry is perceived as being horrifically complicated and difficult. The public wants cleaners without chemicals, skin products without chemicals, food without chemicals, farming without chemicals. Chemicals are viewed as universally bad or toxic without any appreciation of what toxins are, what they might do to our bodies, and how they might get out. Chemical literacy is an all-time low, which is remarkable when you consider how easy it is to get good quality information. There is a backlash against chemicals without any knowledge of what chemicals actually are. Weirdly, there's a distinction made between naturally occurring chemicals and synthesized chemicals when they're exactly the same thing. Back in the 50s, kids enjoy chemistry sets, and here's what the chemistry sets of today look like. 60 fun activities with no chemicals. And if you're interested in chemistry, you're kind of perceived as being a little bit strange. Now, hobby chemists do exist, but they're not well understood, and there are bad connotations once again. Justifying your purchases and actions to the police is par for the course for a hobby chemist. The same cannot be said for sports or other recreational activities. There is a third reason for the difficult language. As scientists, these guys really were on the back foot. Here they were trying to make sense of some crazy observations without the background scientific theory to systemize their discoveries. They lived in a world where it is possible to boil down urine and bone and charcoal and end up with white phosphorus, a substance that spontaneously ignited on contact with air and turned night into day. How could they have known that this was a legitimate chemical process, whereas converting lead to gold was not? So we should excuse them for their misconceptions of what is actually possible. They just did not know and had no way of knowing. They had extremely limited equipment by today's standards, especially missing were analytical techniques, so they could make something interesting but had no way of knowing what they had made. And the language to describe their work had not been invented yet. It couldn't be, since such language must be founded on theory. Dalton's work, where he recognised the existence of elements and gave them symbols, did not come until 1803. Mendeleev's critical work on organising these elements into a systematic arrangement did not come until 1869, some 270 years after Valentine. We need to be glad that we have good chemical notation, a notation that means we can describe unambiguously our chemical theory, our experimental procedures and the results we obtain. If you're new to chemistry, I encourage you to become familiar with good notation and to employ best practice in your writing. There is a difference between chlorine and chloride. It makes a difference whether your numbers are big or small, superscript or subscript. There is a difference between an atom and an ion, between a compound and a molecule, between a shell and an orbital, between reactivity and reduction potential. It is worth getting used to these subtleties so that you have a clear understanding and so that you can make your meaning clear. So, Having worked out that these alchemists weren't cranks or madmen, as we might be tempted to believe, it would be a good idea to repeat some of their work. I'm interested in key number three, which is dragon's blood, or we might call it gold chloride. I won't repeat exactly the same process, but will adapt it for modern equipment. But that's for later. We'll see you next time in the lab.